Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Uh, this is day three of the Intellectual Humility Virtual Symposium. Uh, last week, we heard from Heather Baddeley, Alessandra Tanassini, Marco Meyer, uh, Katerina Helming, Anton Golitzer, Alexandra Chichotska, Rick Hoyle, and uh, Philip Parnamets. And today, we are going to hear from Stephen Lewandowski, uh, Kaylin O'Connor and Jay Van Babel. We had been expecting to hear from Scott Stedman, but unfortunately he's feeling rather unwell and will not be joining us. So we'll have a, a slightly more relaxed uh, conversation uh, in, in this uh, session. Uh, just as a quick reminder, tomorrow we have one final session and that's at the same time and we'll be hearing from Hal Roberts, uh, Maria Bagramian, Shauna Bowes, uh, and myself. Uh, and with that said, I will get out of the way and let Steve uh, do his presentation. Okay, cool. So uh, just need to share my window here. This should do the trick, I think. Okay, so good. Well, I mean, obviously I'm gonna address humility and I wanna address the paradox that the more intellectually, uh, the more humility you exhibit, the more you may actually end up knowing stuff. And I should start out saying that Deborah and Ruth, who are both here, my collaborators uh, from Hebrew University are actually the leading uh, people behind this project, and I'm just the sort of hired mouthpiece that is that is presenting this stuff here. So, um, to put it into context, um, we all know that the previous occupant of the White House had a long-standing record of falsehoods and misleading claims. Statistically, according to fact checkers, equivalent to about 21 falsehoods or misleading statements every day for uh, four years. So that is perhaps something to look at um, in a bit more detail. Now, when you look at this, then of course, the first thing you notice, or you might say is, hey, politicians have always been known to lie to avoid accountability or to achieve a goal. And here are some examples, you know, with American presidents, they're kind of, we know a lot about them and they're easy to use to illustrate these points. You know, Nixon didn't want to get caught over Watergate, so he lied about it. Clinton had different but similar problems. And George Bush wanted to invade Iraq and had to conjure up weapons of mass destruction. Now, I would argue that in all those cases, <clears throat> the lies or deceptions, whatever you want to call them, were were carefully constructed. Um, they actually sort of took care to design a uh, rhetoric to convince the world of something they wanted people to believe. Now, I would argue that today, lies in politics often have no apparent purpose. And two colleagues in sociology, McCrite and Dunlap, <clears throat> they've called the shock and chaos disinformation. And shock and chaos disinformation, I think, is qualitatively different from your conventional Bill Clinton kind of, I didn't have sex sort of uh, falsehoods. Now, one of the things that is remarkable about shock and chaos disinformation, in addition to the fact that lies tend not to have a point, what's remarkable is that challenges to the misinformation by others often are not met with a rebuttal or debate or saying, yeah, well, hang on, actually, you know, I think I'm right. But instead, they're met with what I would call ontological gerrymandering. That is that instead of addressing the issue on the table, the claim is being made that, well, there is nothing to address here because truth isn't truth, or we have alternative facts, or, you know, facts, ugh, that's out of date. There is no such thing as a fact anymore. Now, I don't think that's a coincidence. I don't think that these are just anecdotes. Uh, in fact, if you look at the history of the ontology of truth, 
then you discover that this sort of extreme form of relativism, constructivism, is an element of fascism. And I mean, you know, the Nazis were, uh, you know, constructivists in the extreme because the only thing that counted was the intuition of the Führer who had divined the truth in his own way. Uh, now, needless to say, this is, in my, to my mind, incompatible with democratic norms of evidence and truth seeking. So we should take that seriously, I think, this, this sort of ontological gerrymandering, the shift from lies with a purpose to just making stuff up all the time. Now, if you think that's a problem, then here's the second problem. And the second problem is twofold. Number one, using again Donald Trump as an example, approval throughout his presidency was remarkably constant. The dip you can perhaps see or perceive at the end here was after he lost the election. But throughout his time in office, he did okay. And at no point in his presidency he did less than more than three quarters of Republicans approve of him. Now, if you ask Republicans whether they think he's honest, they repeatedly in various different opinion polls said yes by a huge margin, about three to one. This is just one poll from NBC in April 2018. There's others throughout. And they all come up with the same conclusion. Republicans thought of Donald Trump as being honest. So somehow all these misstatements didn't have an effect on his support. The honesty was replaced with something else. And there's a number of arguments one can make about this. The one that I want to explore today is based on Hannah Arendt's work in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, Hannah Arendt was one of the foremost analysts of totalitarianism in the 20th century. And I think she is more relevant today than, you know, for the last 20 or 30 years. And what she was pointing out based on anecdotes really or conceptual analysis, but not data, is that the thing about totalitarianism is that the distinction between truth and falsehood is just being obliterated. Um, so that at some point in time, people believe everything and nothing, think that everything was possible and nothing was true. So it's not the fact that totalitarian regimes want people to believe certain things rather than other things. What the, the point she's making is that what they want people to do is to give up on the notion of truth. And if you look at you know, Hitler's record of stringing together lie after lie and contradicting himself and everything, then I think there's an argument, argument to be made that uh, she is true. So based on this idea that we have shifted from or into the shock and chaos disinformation where politicians, and it's not just Trump, you know, you look at all the populist leaders around the world, the dude in Brazil, uh, there's another guy in, on an island off the coast of Europe who's, who's just like Trump. Um, you know, they, they all have the same attribute of just making stuff up and just creating a blizzard of lies and falsehoods without any uh, accountability. Now, how is this possible? Well, how is it possible that, that people buy into this or accept that? Well, what, what are the consequences of that? Who are the people who believe this and who are the people who might contribute to this? Well, what I want to do today is to report a study that um, we've done recently where we're exploring this sort of tripartite space of distrust gullibility and humility. Now, let me, let me walk you through why these constructs and what I mean by that. Now, here's a statement from a conspiratorial website. I would call it a conspiratorial website that uh, does not believe in the official account of 9-11, but instead says, you know, if you think 9-11 was the result of you know, box cutters and collapsing entire buildings, you really are a sheep. Um, so 
What does that statement tell us? Well, it tells us that on the one hand, there is a fundamental distrust of the official explanation for 9-11, which was a terrorist attack perpetrated by people, you know, who we know came from various places and we sort of knew what they did. It's distrust um, of that account, but it's also accompanied by gullibility. I mean, you can't say this and, and not believe something else. And if you believe something else and you ask people what it is they believe, well, then it is some random guy on Twitter who says, oh, it was a controlled demolition. And the next day it was no longer a controlled demolition. It was bombs strapped to the airplanes, which were actually empty. I mean, you know, the, 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 there's just a lot of belief going on in a lot of di diverse statements, which to my mind requires considerable gullibility. Now, there's evidence for this. Previous work has shown that um, people who believe in conspiracy theories are actually quite gullible because they also buy into other things not just conspiracies, but things like pseudo profound bullshit. That's now a technical term, by the way, in the literature, there are papers written on pseudo profound bullshit, um, which, which are basically random strings of words uh, put out by a robot uh, to generate tweets that are allegedly deeply philosophical, but they're not. They're random strings of letters, of words. And people who believe in conspiracies also believe in that. So there is gullibility at work. Humility, how does humility fit into this? Well, it fits into, you know, both of the other constructs. I want to focus again on this, what I find just amazing gullibility accompanied by a complete lack of humility. Here's one of my favorite examples, a recent survey of, you know, 1,300 Americans. So power was not an issue where about a third of respondents indicated that they know as much or more than doctors and scientists about the causes of autism. Now, it turns out if you then ask these people about autism, they, they knew the least of all respondents, but they were the ones saying, I know more than the doctors do. Now, that's not an isolated finding. There's, there's, a, there's at least three papers out there uh, there's another one that deals with GMO, where that's the same thing. People who say, I know more about genetically modified organisms than the biologists do. They're the people who know nothing about GMO. And likewise, in other domains. So there's a connection here between lack of humility and, I guess, to some extent, gullibility, because they have to actually believe you know, honestly, that they know more than doctors do, which I think is pretty, it's a tough, you know, it's a tough ask. I, I don't think I could get myself to really believe that. Um, so we have these constructs sitting around that I think hang together very nicely and might, might make for a very interesting story. And so we designed this uh, exploratory study. We've actually done a whole bunch. I'm presenting the the, well, the best one, the last one. They always get better over time as you learn things. Um, and what we did there was to select facts and then, for lack of a better term, alternative facts. That is things that are false and that stand in opposition to an accepted official truth. So for example, um, smoking is harmful for one's health. Well, I consider that to be a fact that is not contested by you know, any source of any authority, of any epistemic authority. There's a widespread consensus on that. Um, governments have acted on it. You know, That's just a fact. <clears throat> How can you oppose that fact? Well, you can make up the opposite and you can say it can actually be good for you. And that's precisely what we did. We started out with something that we considered to be self-evidently true we then created an alternative fact that denied that official account. So what that did was to set up an opposition, both in terms of you know, distrusting the official account, but also with that considerable gullibility uh, in, in believing the alternative fact, the opposite. And just another example here is that on the one hand, gold is a limited resource. Yeah, well, it is. Um, 
the alternative fact is that you know there's an abundance but it's somehow hidden from us uh it's, it's lying out there in the desert but it's being kept from us and and so on we had like i don't know a dozen or 15 of these um each participant would see one or the other of the pair not both and they would respond to that on, on and just give you know give us their truth ratings um and we'll see in a moment how those truth ratings behave both as a function of continuous predictors and on the basis of a pre-selected sample now we went to the us to prolific got us a representative sample uh participants american participants but we selected them based on their attitudes towards COVID 19 vaccinations in in roughly equal numbers um it's much easier to find participants in the support group than in the opposed group, but we managed to get it roughly equal. Now, what is interesting or important about this selection process is that the vaccination attitudes were previously established by prolific. So it's not that we asked them first about their attitudes and that then maybe somehow, you know, that translated into some other responses later in the survey. We pulled them in with them not knowing uh, why they were given the link uh, to the survey. And it was either because they opposed COVID-19 vaccines or supported them. So the idea here was to find some sort of a, uh, you know, a cleaver to divide people into those who we think are positively inclined towards evidence and, and science and others who are probably uh, not quite so positively inclined. And then we added a variety of, of uh, predictor, potential predictors through questionnaires, um, measuring the constructs of, of interest, distrust, gullibility, humility, and then also reliance on intuition as a source of knowledge, which previous research has shown to be a very interesting variable that correlates highly with conspiratorial thinking uh, and so on. Um, and just for those of you who haven't seen the need for chaos scale, basically it has items like society needs to be burned to the ground. All our institutions have to be destroyed and we have to rebuild from scratch. Um, there's a surprisingly large number of people that endorse all that. And if you think that that is uh, perhaps just you know, people saying this to keep the experimenter happy, don't forget that any fascism is based on this idea of a rebirth after this cleansing Holocaust or whatever, large scale violence, destruction, and then, you know, there's this rebirth. So people who say that kind of thing are, are not exactly isolated in history. They're maybe not on the right side of history, but they're certainly not without precedent. And of course, the humility scales in this forum, I'm assuming you're all familiar with. So what did we find? Well, I found a lot of interesting stuff that replicated previous work, which is uh, always nice and means that what we're doing here is, is probably pointing in the right direction. So let me walk you through that step by step. Uh, the green are the people who are pro-vax, the red are the people who are anti-vax. Um, we found higher distrust among the people who are anti-vax than pro-vax, uh, greater reliance on intuition as a source of knowledge as opposed to evidence. Both of these replicate previous work, so that's good. I mean, our sample wasn't, you know, different from anything else uh, people have seen. Uh, anti-vax people were considerably more likely to endorse conspiracy theories or to show a propensity towards conspiratorial thinking. And, and that effect is huge here, by the way. And I expect it to be, because if you look at the association between conspiratorial thinking and anti-vax, um, it's like 0.5, very high. A quarter of the variance is, is accounted for by conspiratorial beliefs. It's, it's very high, and, and we show that here. Humility, this is also replicating recent work. It's a smaller effect, but these are all significant. The standard errors, by the way, the bars are standard deviations, not standard errors. So they, they're not totally informative. 
these differences are significant either way, whichever we measure, whichever way we measure humility using Marx scale or theory scale, we find that the people who endorse vaccinations are, are higher in intellectual humility. They're more likely to acknowledge they might be wrong. Um, and finally, this is on the one hand new, but also mesh as well with one of my recent papers, uh, anti-vaxxers have a greater need for chaos. They're more likely to say, let's burn society to the ground than pro-vax. So this is all kind of interesting and puts the sample and the study into a good context because we're replicating everything <coughs> that we can expect to replicate. Now, here's the thing that's new and that we're interested in. How does this vaccine attitude map into acceptance of facts versus alternative facts? And what you can see is, well, perhaps unsurprisingly, the anti-vaxxers are more likely to endorse false statements such as that, you know, smoking is good for you, gold is abundant, all these things. And they're less likely, significantly so, to endorse actual facts. And we can summarize those, those two bars by creating a measure we call information discernment. That's just the difference in belief between facts and alternative facts. And the greater that number, the better you are at sifting facts from falsehoods. And we get a very large effect, I would argue, on, on the scale we're using, a seven point scale. Uh, those two groups are pretty far apart. And that, needless to say, is highly significant. So that's our first hint that, you know, people who don't believe facts will believe something else. They'll believe nothing official in anything uh, that rejects the official account. Well, the rest of the data, the correlational analysis supports that. Uh, looking first at humility uh, for each scale, you can really probably ignore the facts and the alternative beliefs because you know the discernment score is really summarizing them both. And the greater the humility, the greater the discernment. The more people believe facts and the less they are misled by endorsing things that are false. So, uh, hence the title of the talk that being, being willing to admit you might be wrong actually means you're better at understanding the truth. And here are the, the uh, not surprisingly, the, what I call the enemies of truth discernment. Reliance on intuition. Yes, of course. If you think evidence is no good and you rely on intuition, then, well, guess what? You might have difficulty telling truth from falsehood. Distrust, need for chaos, and quite significantly and quite, you know, quite a large correlation, uh, endorsement of conspiracies or having a propensity towards endorsing uh, conspiracies. And those two, by the way, the need for chaos and conspiracy theorizing are highly correlated. Conspiracy theorists are very likely to say things like, you know, we got to burn everything to the ground and rebuild society from scratch. Um, which is not entirely surprising, but which also identifies conspiratorial beliefs as something maybe not just harmless. So conclusions, <clears throat> I was given 20 minutes and I think I'll stick <clears throat> to that plus minus two minutes. <clears throat> well, uh, <clears throat> the what is now obvious from my presentation, I think that um, we can predict discernment between facts and alternative facts on the basis of uh, known predictors of epistemic skill <clears throat> and the lack thereof, namely conspiracism and reliance on intuition. <clears throat> um, now, I also want to point out that there are two of our measures that, that are, are sort of pseudo-political. By that, I mean that they're not actually articulated political positions in a conventional sense. You would have it in a democracy. But they're nonetheless sort of political. If you want to burn down a country, that's kind of political. So uh, need for chaos, I would say, is a pseudo-political stance. And distrust in everything and anything is, of course, also a you know, politically relevant stance, although it sits outside conventional uh, politics. And finally, in the final slide, I want to tie this back to Hannah Arendt and, and what 
we said at the beginning. And, and to paraphrase what she said and to paraphrase even more our results, I'll argue that distrustful people will believe nothing that is official, but will believe anything that rejects the official account. Now, you know, these are on a scale and there are differences here with error bars. So the nothing and anything is an overstatement, but as a caricature, that is what we found. Now, what I think is particularly interesting here is that we observed this effect with information that to the best of our knowledge was not highly politicized and doesn't really tap into people's identity. I mean, gold, mining gold, I mean, is that really highly political or an identity issue? Well, maybe in Australia, if you have, if you work in the mining industry, but outside of that, I, I don't see that. And the facts that we paired with these opposing alternative facts, they were all well-established, not contested. It's not even like climate change where there's the appearance of a debate uh, in Australia where there's the mining industry. Um, you know, it, it's not even like that. It is, it, there is no contestation of, of these facts. And yet, um, that drove people apart based on their attitudes to, to vaccinations or equivalently based on their humility and all the other predictors I've identified. So I don't think it's an isolated thing that only applies to motivated cognition. I would argue it's a more fundamental ability to uh, accept obvious facts and reject falsehoods that some people are just not, you know, they just don't have it or they don't want to uh, articulate that. So thank you. I'll leave it at that and I welcome your questions. <clears throat> Great. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, if anyone has a question, uh, please just type Q in the chat. It looks like we have three already. Yep. So let's start hey. with Kaylin. Hi, Kaylin. Ah, there you are. Hello. Uh, Oh, there we go. Sorry. Um, thanks, Steve. So I had a question about conspiracism and how to think about this and its association uh, with, um, you know, the results in this. So whether this is something that we should think of as like a cause or an effect, at some point, I think you said something like the tendency to believe conspiracy theories, which sounds like an individual trait that that would cause certain outcomes. But I could also imagine it being, you know, that the fact that people are believing many conspiracy theories, the result of other traits like whatever lack of intellectual humility or other things. And so what's what's the right way to think about that measure? Yeah, great question. I mean, I think, first of all, uh, I only talked about associations, and I hope I didn't imply causality anywhere, because, I mean, obviously I can't. Um, uh, having said that, there, there is evidence that conspiracism or whatever you want to call it, you know, endorsement or propensity towards conspiratorial thinking is dispositional. Uh, indeed, it's a stable characteristic of people that is predictable on the basis of other personality indicators and cognitive styles. And when I say predictable, I mean, again, you know, it's associated and, and I'm not making any causal claims. But um, so, for example, reliance on intuition and uh, magical thinking. And I mean, you can almost guess what it would be, right, that that is associated with conspiratorial thinking. And that's certainly the case. Now, having said that, there, there is one important exception to that or qualification, and that is that very often, or at least, well, at least when I run an experiment, then I can do this, very often people deploy conspiratorial rhetoric as a get out of jail for free card. So um, I did a study that was published a few weeks or months ago where I showed that um, if you're asked, if you're confronting people with the consensus on climate change, the fact that all the scientists basically agree on that, and you then ask them to explain why that is, then their 
pre-market attitudes, which are a very strong predictor of climate attitudes. They explain about half the variance. Um, those attitudes also predict whether people will then explain the consensus based on scientific evidence or based on conspiratorial claims like the scientists are in it for the money or they they want to form a world government or something and and in the same study with the same people if i also test their conspiratorial disposition that doesn't actually explain as much of the variance in how people see the consensus so that to me suggests that sometimes people deploy conspiratorial rhetoric just just to be able to say you know ah climate change is a hoax and then they fly to bali on their holiday and they can do that guilt free you know it's kind of easy um so i think i think there are these two components here what i think we're picking up through the questionnaire the imhoff and bruder scale is is a dispositional tendency and and i think it's pretty stable but I wouldn't tell you how, what, what it's causing or what it's caused by. I can't say that. Great, thanks. Uh, next up is Marco, and he's unmuted already. Great. Thank you We're so much. Marco. This is absolutely fascinating. Um, ah, yeah. I have a very self-serving question because I'm quite interested in studying the relationship between humility and populism and the economy. Uh -huh that I have in mind is one that brings together distrust of politicians, government, and so on, with um, a certain type of lack of humility, where you really think you know at, at least as well. So I think, you know, all of those issues are yeah. really very commonsensical, and you can just divine what the best policy for your health uh, care system is um, at, at a beer table, whatever. So my Absolutely. question, how does this idea of populism, populism sit between your gullibility, distrust, and um, humility? And I ask that because this Gallup statistic seems to be getting exactly at that. So I was wondering whether you, yes. you think about that. Yes. Yeah, uh, again, great question. I think, first of all, I think you're absolutely right. And uh, to support that empirically, there's a very strong correlation between the share of populist votes across European countries and the degree of vaccine hesitancy in that country. It's like stunning. I mean, I can show, I can dig out the scatter plot. It's like something from a statistics lecture, you know, 0.8. Uh, the more populist votes the more vaccine hesitancy so it's very clear at the states now you compare vaccination uptake between republican and and uh, democratic based on their vote share for trump or biden you get the same correlation the more trump the less vaccination the more biden the more vaccination so at that level there's a very clear relationship between populism and and you know one of the variables that we use to select people today on the the, the sort of whole thing of of i know i know what i can divine for myself i mean absolutely that that is the the ontology of, of fascism basically you know and and yes you know there's a difference between populism and fascism i know all that but <laughs> if you look at the literature and work out what the ontology is then there's a very smooth transition between classic fashion they actually articulate this you know i mean there were people out there articulating this philosophy for the nazis and and you now you can read this stuff and they weren't kidding they they were serious about that uh, and, and then it's manifestation today in populists. And I mean, you know, Donald Trump has said at his campaign rallies, you know, don't believe what you see. Don't trust your eyes. Don't trust your ears. Just listen to me. I mean, he said that. Uh, so I'm, I'm convinced you're absolutely right that, you know, populism is, is <laughs> characterized by lack of humility and lots of other things. Yeah. Thanks. Just a really brief follow up on that. I was wondering whether focusing on the intellectual here is is maybe a bit um, confusing. So maybe there's a sort of attitude of you can't tell me what to believe or what to think. 
um, that also transcends to you can't tell me what to do, you can't tell me what to like, um, and, right? So you think of people who are eating, uh, you know, 500 grams of meat, red meat per day just to, to stick it to the libs. Um, the, there's this kind of defiance um, that, that maybe is a, a somewhat broader disposition uh, and that we're seeing come up in the epistemic case here, but is, is maybe related to other things as well. Yeah, and there is data on that. Matt Hornsey has done um, at least one study recently where he showed that reactance, trait reactance, is a predictor of vaccine hesitancy. You know, a very strong predictor. And reactance is exactly that. You don't tell me what to do. Um, and, and therefore, don't tell me to take a vaccine. I know what's, what's best for me. Now, um, I, I also think, however, that, that there is a political context to this. And that's something I didn't have time to get into. But, you know, populism isn't there all the time, right? You know, 20 years ago, we did not have this surge of populism in, in Western countries. And so you have, to, you have to ask, well, what is going on here? Why is this successful? Um, and that's very complicated, I think. But in a nutshell, there's experiments that show that populism and, and the lying that goes with it, which is an intrinsic aspect of populism, is to lie because it's, it's, a, it's a feature, not a bug, for populist politicians. And the reason it's a feature is because they are violating an establishment norm. If I lie, I'm not doing what the establishment wants me to do. So I lie for my followers to think, oh, he's sucking it to the lips, you know, as, as you just said, Mark. So the lying becomes a feature, but it will only become a feature under certain circumstances having to do with people either feeling left out of a system or feeling threatened by others. So you have this terrible, this unholy alliance between rich people who vote for Trump because they, they feel threatened by women and minorities and poor people who vote for because they feel left behind. And, and whenever you have populism or fascism, you, you, you have both. And, and everybody else is, is sandwiched in the middle and, and in a pincer. So in a nutshell, that, that has to be added there. Thanks. Uh, I think Jay is next. Yeah, fantastic talk, Stephen. Um, I love the connection with uh, Hannah Arendt and all, all the, the approaches that you integrated. Um, the one that just, I don't know a ton about it, but every time I see work on it, it fascinates me is the need for chaos. And I was wondering huh. if you could tell me a few things about your need for the need for chaos. The first is maybe to follow up Mark's question, is it uh, ideological? You know, in a general sense, not just outside of the American context, is it like correlated more with 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 leftists or rightists, or is it really something for people at the political extremes, or or both of those happening? And then, and then my next question is, um, my one concern when I think of that measure is that are those people just screwing with you when they give you answers about like accurate or inaccurate yeah, yeah. things? They're like the type of people who are just like, I know that this is going to mess with the professor's study or the academics or <laughs> this snobs yeah, or whatever. Yes. Yeah, so the, I, those are my kind of questions. What's the ideological extreme? Yeah, well, the uh, to be, okay, to be honest, when I uh, first um, saw that need for chaos scale when it was an unpublished paper and I saw those numbers, you know, up to 30% of Americans are endorsing this, I thought, really? Uh, do they really? And then when I started working with the scale and I, I looked at the um, correlations between that scale and other instruments, that's when I thought, well, hang on, there's something real going on here. And the most recent paper um, that I cited in the talk, uh, I forget the name, um, it's a French name, that's why I can't pronounce it. Um, anyway, uh, they broke it down further into clusters of, of attitudes and it just makes a hell of a lot of sense. Um, so yeah, Arsenal et al, that paper just came out in the Royal Society Journal this year. I thought that was again, pretty, pretty impressive. So if your hypothesis were right, you know, they're just saying this kind of stuff, 
then I find it hard to explain how they then also <laughs> fake everything else in such a way that is completely consonant with everything else we know and theoretically meaningful. I mean, it's kind of, you know, I'm, I'm then beginning to think, well, that's, maybe it's for real. And if you listen to the rhetoric, I mean, you listen to Trump and his followers events of January 6th. I mean, what was January 6th other than an attempt to tear down constitutional democracy in the United States? I mean, you don't even have to do surveys. You, you just you know, hide in the basement of the Congress and witness it firsthand. I mean, you know, you, that to me is the proof in the pudding. We have time for a quick question from Anton. Thank you for unmuting me. Uh, yeah, very quick. Uh, first of all, I just want to say that love, love the idea of looking at discernment uh, and, and to find those results is, is really encouraging uh, for intellectual humility. Uh, so, so my question is basically uh, in terms of um, uh, the results, I'm wondering if uh, if the relationship between a discernment and IH may not be entirely linear. So I'm wondering if you've looked at non-linear analyses for that relationship. So for instance, right, uh, it could be that, you know, people who are very low in IH, so this is kind of where the music is. Uh, so those people are really struggling with discernment, but at a certain level of intellectual humility, everybody else is doing fine. Uh, I'm kind of wondering if that's a possibility. Oh, totally. I can't rule it out. I also couldn't rule it in on the basis of, of these sample sizes. I mean, I, to be honest, if you really wanted to know to the answer, the answer to that, I, I think you're talking about 3,000 participants because, you know, this gets to be really tricky because, I mean, first of all, you have to decide whether you can even model this using what we've done here, which is to add up the responses, average it, which, you know, 90% of the time works just fine. But if you want to get into linearities and disentangle that from other possibilities, then you really got to have a, you know, a multinomial model or an ordered probit model for the different response categories. And then it just becomes, you know, okay, you can do it. You can estimate these parameters, but I wouldn't want to do it with any less than at least a thousand people from experience, just look at these data. So yeah, maybe, but I, I can't use data. Thanks so much for a fascinating talk, Steve. I'm going to turn it over to Kaylin. Well, thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks for um, having me and for organizing. So hi, folks. I'm Kaylin O'Connor. Um, when Mark invited me to join the symposium, I pointed out, well, I don't really work on intellectual humility. He said that was okay. I could charge forward with what I do. So the talk I'm going to give is part of a larger project I have, a, a book project, and then an ongoing grant project doing modeling work, looking at the spread of the social spread of false beliefs, especially. And in this particular project, we look at how some different social psychological and then sort of um, reasoning biases would impact the way, like, you know, ideas and information would spread between people. And so there's sort of some connection, but it's a little, a little something different. So the title of the talk is Polarization, Conformity, and uh, Confirmation. So what I'm going to do is kind of briefly discuss three different models we've looked at. And what was kind of interesting about them is that they all generate polarization via different mechanisms. So I'll say more about what the three things are. Um, this is joint work with Jim Weatherall, who is my um, co-author on the Misinformation Age book and also my co-PI on our current grant. This is actually a more recent picture, uh, but before the pandemic, he looked something more like this. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so here's something about our methodology in this project. So we use agent-based network models. So these are models where we represent different individuals and then the communicative or social ties between them. In each project, we take an epistemic network. So a network where we assume these agents are trying to figure out some things about the world. And then we basically add in something that represents a kind of common social or psychological feature. We say, what happens when we 
give them this feature. And then in each project, we show how just adding, you know, some different social feature can shape the learning outcomes. And in particular, we find in each case that adding some feature can lead to polarization emerging. And, you know, I don't think this is an entirely new observation, but it sort of underpins a picture where polarization can be caused by a lot of different sorts of things. And so in thinking about real world cases of polarization, you wanna have a lot of possible explanations for it at hand when you go to try to figure out what's really causing it in some particular scenario. All right, so just really quickly, I'll sort of introduce very briefly the models and then talk about the three different features we add and how each one generates um, different learning outcomes and polarization. All right, so we draw on this modeling framework, which was started by um, uh, Bella and Goyal, this team in economics, and then brought into philosophy by Kevin Zolman, sometimes called the network epistemology framework. And it was first a model uh, intended to think about social learning and people who could get data from others in their social networks. So these models have two key features. So the first is what's called a decision problem, and then they have a network. So the decision problem involves all the agents in the model having to pick between two actions or two action guiding theories, which we'll call A and B, which succeed at different rates. And then the problem is to figure out, even though they're unsure, which of these is in fact the better action um, which of these should I believe in? Which of these should I engage in? And then the models, we usually start them off with random credences or beliefs about whether A or B is better. In fact, we always assume that B is better, B for better. And then, so they start with these kind of random beliefs. And then as time goes on, they take actions that reflect their beliefs. So maybe these beliefs are cigarette smoking is dangerous. Cigarette smoking is safe. And if they think it's dangerous, they don't smoke cigarettes. And if they think it's safe, they do. Um, so they use their belief to shape their actions. And then they sort of see what happens. So they test the world, they get data from the world, and then they change their credences or beliefs over time. And the usual assumption in these models is that they use Bayes' rule, which is you know, just a rational rule for how you should change your beliefs when you see data. And then in addition, you know, so they're testing things and they're getting information about the world. And then they're also looking at what other people are doing. So when they have network connections to other people, they see what happened when that person tried smoking or not smoking or tried using a particular drug or whatever it is. And so over time, they can both learn from the world and learn from each other and try to figure out the truth of which action is in fact a better action. All right, so that's the sort of basis of the model. And a number of people um, in philosophy and economics have looked at this sort of model and have found that what happens in this simple version of it is that the community ends up at consensus. So over time, via this process of testing and sharing information, they come to agree on one of these two options. And usually what happens is that they become quite confident that the better action is in fact better because their tests give them information about the world and then they develop accurate beliefs. Sometimes they all settle on the worst action though. And this can happen if, for example, they get some strings of misleading data, you know, the sort of options are probabilistically good or bad. And so they might get data that makes it look like B is actually pretty bad. And if they share that data socially, then you can end up with them all kind of settling on the worst thing and then not really continuing to explore the better theory. So you have these different kinds of outcomes. And this kind of model has been used um, a lot to think about scientific consensus and theory change, but also to think more broadly, especially in social epistemology, about how groups of people um, come to consensus beliefs about things. All right, so now I'll talk about the things we do with it in this project. So in the first, in each case, we're gonna sort of add something to this model and see what happens. Um, in our first project, the key alteration has to do with social trust. And we change the model by assuming that each agent is gonna be more likely to trust evidence 
that comes from someone who holds similar beliefs. And we know that this is a heuristic that people employ pretty commonly when learning from each other. And we point out in the paper that in science, at least, this is somewhat reasonable or it's a, maybe a justifiable epistemic trait because you don't want to trust data from everyone. People often say, well, it's irresponsible to trust data gathered by someone who's a quack, who's untrustworthy. And if you yourself think, well, I'm good at reasoning about the world, you might deduce that if this other person has a really different opinion from you, they're maybe not trustworthy. Maybe they're not good at learning about the world and the data they share with you isn't data that you should pay attention to. So we sort of add a parameter that makes people you know, more or less trusting in those who hold different beliefs. And the first thing we find when we add this parameter is now you can have polarization in the model. So before everyone would come to consensus. Now, if you have enough mistrust, you can have states where you end up with two different camps who hold quite different beliefs, maybe one favors B and one favors A, and their beliefs are far enough apart that they don't trust the evidence coming from the other camp. So they basically stop learning about what the other people are testing because when the other people say, look, we found out B is really great, the A team says, you know, you guys are weirdos and we don't think your data is any good. And so this is a little figure showing this, mistrust is going up on the x-axis. On the y-axis, we say, how often do these simulations end up at polarization, two separate camps of belief? And as mistrust goes up, polarization goes up as well. The other main thing we find is that the more mistrust we add to these models, the worse the community beliefs in the end. Um, because when there's a lot of mistrust, you do end up with these groups who have bad beliefs and who won't listen to evidence coming from the group with good beliefs, so accurate evidence that might shift their beliefs. So again, here's mistrust increasing on the x-axis and on the y-axis we ask at the end of simulation, what percentage of people in the model held false beliefs? This is across basically all the models we run, all the parameter values. You can see that's just very clearly steadily trending up. So a little takeaway from this bit, while there's something reasonable about a scientist or an individual who's skeptical of someone who has reached different conclusions from them, um, we find that this kind of skepticism on a global level nonetheless hurts the knowledge producing capacity of a community, makes the community generally worse at producing knowledge, and leads to stable polarization. All right, so that's the first. Now in the second one, we add conformity to the model. So starting in the 50s with the famous ASH experiments and then very widely replicated after that, it's been documented that humans have tendencies towards social conformity, meaning people don't like to stick out from a crowd. They often don't like to take actions that are different from those in their community. They often don't like to state opinions from those that are different from a group they're in. And so now what we add to the model has nothing to do with trust, but tracks a tendency toward conformity. So we add a parameter which says, how much do the actors care about matching their behaviors to their network neighbors versus how much do they care about choosing the correct arm? So again, they have, sorry, the correct action. So again, they have beliefs about which action is correct. They prefer to pick the correct one, but if enough of their neighbors sort of go against what they want, they might prefer to conform. And then we sort of scale up how much they like to conform or scale it down. So they're weighing these two desires in this model. Um, and again, we find that polarization can emerge once you get enough conformist tendency, but in this case, it's via a different causal route. So in the mistrust model, you could get polarization sort of no matter how everyone was connected to each other, no matter the social network structure. In this kind of case, you only get it when you have what are called cliques, which are groups in the network where the friends of my friends are also my friends. So people tend to be tightly connected to each other. And what can happen when you have cliques, so this is an image that shows like a very kind of idealized clique structure, is you can have a group of people who all believe that A is the better action, that's what these letters mean. And they all choose action A. That's what these white dots mean. And a group of people who all think B is the better action and choose action B. 
and they can be connected to each other. So it can be one community in some sense. But you can have individuals like this one who have learned that B is better, so they're getting information from another community. But because they conform with their clique, they never start trying B out. You know, they don't want to stick out. And the fact that they never switch to B means that all of the people connected to them in their clique don't actually learn about B themselves. They don't find out that this better action is better. And so you can get these sort of stable arrangements where different cliques hold different beliefs. And we find that sort of the more conformity you have, if you have the right network structures with cliques, the more likely polarization is. And again, we find it in these models that the more we sort of scale conformity up, the worse the beliefs get. So it's a little bit of a confusing graph. The details don't matter that much, but conformity is going up again on the x-axis. This is how much we see a bunch of all the different kind of outcomes in the model. And basically what we're seeing is the outcomes where they take the correct actions become less likely and the ones with the incorrect actions more likely the more conformity you have and polarization becomes more likely too. All right, so sort of takeaway here, conformity plus network structures. This is another sufficient cause for polarization. It can be caused by social trust. It can be caused by just conformity. Again, we found conformity kind of hurts knowledge producing capacities in these models. And that actually goes against some previous results, which if people are curious about, I'm happy to talk about. And here, the sort of cause for the epistemic harm was that you have people who are conforming, who as a result fail to take good actions, and then when they don't take good actions, they deprive their networks and na network neighbors of learning opportunities. All right, last little thing, confirmation bias. So this is the last one. The last, so the first two papers I mentioned focus on what you might think of as kind of dyadic or interactive um, traits where it has something to do with others in your community. But we can also ask, how do individual reasoning biases that people have looked at before function in a social setting? And we've just been starting to look at that a little bit. And we have been looking at a model of confirmation bias. So this is a very widespread reasoning bias. It's sort of a set of biases. And it refers to cases where individuals tend to be more receptive to evidence that fits their current belief. So if I believe B, I'm more receptive to evidence that you know, fits with B than with evidence that points toward A. This paper, by the way, is a collaboration with um, a graduate student in LPS, Nathan Gabriel, and he sort of is the main driver on this work and, you know, did most of the modeling. So what we do now is add to the network a function that says, well, if I see data, how likely am I to change my beliefs on the basis of it? And in particular, that scales with the likelihood of that evidence obtaining given my current beliefs. So if I you know, believe smoking is dangerous and I see data confirming smoking is dangerous, I think that data was quite likely to really obtain in the world given my current beliefs. And so I'm, I'm more likely to sort of change my beliefs on the basis of it. Whereas if the data looks unlikely to me given my current state, I don't tend to update on it. Now, this surprisingly, I thought what would happen was that um, you know, Nathan would model this and it would hurt the community again. It would be one more bias that made them worse. Uh, it actually makes them better um, as long as it's not too much. So <laughs> here we can see this is for different size networks. This is how often they come to successful beliefs. And this is how much confirmation bias they show. So basically, the more confirmation bias they have, the better the network tends to do, the more often the group comes to successful beliefs. Um, that surprised us. After we got the results though, we realized it actually fit with some previous results, both experimental and formal, showing that sometimes when you have groups of people who influence each other too much, it's actually bad for their learning. So if you have a lot of influence within a group, it can be that someone gets some misleading string of data, everybody sees it, and then they all settle on the worst, worst belief, and they stop paying attention to the better belief. So in these models, the groups tend to do better when there's some preservation of diversity of behavior for a while, when you have people testing both actions for a while, 
and testing them long enough to kind of get enough data to develop good beliefs. And confirmation bias in the group setting actually makes them do that because it makes them more stubborn. They stick with their own beliefs for longer. And so they test a number of different things and then eventually they kind of tend to settle on more accurate theories. But notice those results are from models where agents never entirely ignore information. They become less likely to pay attention to some information, but there's always some chance they do update on it. If we change that feature and give them a really high level of confirmation bias, polarization again becomes possible. Now, for a new different reason, because you can have two different camps and neither camp is willing to update on data that would push them in the other direction because they don't like that kind of data. And that, again, we think can hurt the knowledge producing capacity of a community that we're still um, running, looking at this simulations here. All right, so takeaways there. Confirmation bias may have some epistemic epistemic benefits at low levels and at higher levels may actually be harmful and again can cause polarization. So a kind of general takeaway here, which I think is interesting is that, you know, we have seen across a bunch of things we've looked at these sufficient causes for polarization. Um, these models don't tell us what's causing polarization in the real world. They're very simple models, but they show us in principle this kind of social mistrust of people who don't share our beliefs, a desire for conformity, and um, confirmation, confirmation bias. Each one of these things alone can cause polarization. Uh, so this shows a kind of interesting use for the models too. I mean, in the real world, you can't ever get a group of people who only exhibit one of these traits. But in the model, you can say, we're just going to say all our people don't have any confirmation bias. What happens when they just conform and see that that alone is sufficient to cause polarization? Um, and we think that's you know, relevant to further empirical exploration of polarization in any particular case. So to summarize, mistrust can lead to polarization even among kind of scientific agents, people who are trying to learn about the world. Conformity bias can be harmful and lead to polarization. Confirmation bias sort of surprisingly can actually have some benefit in communities, but it has its downside too. And then last, there are these many possible causes for polarization, and these are only three, there's more too. Um, untangling these or keeping a lot of possibilities in mind, we think is good when you're looking at polarization in real world communities. With that, I will. Stop sharing, say thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Kaylin. That was really cool. So uh, as before, uh, if you have a question, just type Q in the chat. And it looks like Marco is up first. Thank you. And thanks for this. I, uh, I love agent-based models. It was really enjoyable. There's really just a, um, invitation to say a bit more about how you model the first and the third case differently, because it seemed as if there would be a way of modeling both cases in the same way, right? In the one case, you are distrusting people who believe something other than you. In the other case, you're more likely to believe someone who believes the same thing as you do, so that you know, there, there's a way of cashing it out where it becomes formally the same thing. So I'd love to understand what, what the difference really is. And the small addendum to that question is, on the slides for the first model, you had uncertainty as a term, not mistrust. So I was wondering, you know, is there a way of interpreting the model also in a way that actually doesn't have uh, mistrust, but rather uncertainty in there? Yeah, so... Thank you. So actually, that's the first question, I think, is based on a slight misunderstanding. And I know I went really quick through these. So in the first model, the mistrust is entirely based on the other agent. Does this agent share my beliefs? If they share data that's disconfirming to my beliefs, but they are in my same kind of epistemic space or camp, I trust that data. So it's as if, you know, I'm a climate change denier, you're a climate change denier, 
you're like, look, I, I saw this article that made climate change look pretty real. I would trust that even though it doesn't fit my beliefs in the first model. Um, and then in the third model, it's, there's no sensitivity to what the agent believes. It's entirely about the data. So you and I could have very similar beliefs, but you share data that disconfirms my belief and I ignore that data. So basically it's an, you know, both are miscounting evidence for some reason, but the question is why am I miscounting the evidence? What's the sort of source of my mistrust of the evidence? Um, and then uncertainty. So basically in that mistrust model, the way we operationalize mistrust is that you treat data as less certain to have occurred if someone has a really different belief from you. So, um, you know, in Bayesian updating, you can do what's, I mean, you, you probably know, but not everyone will, what's called Jeffrey conditionalization, where you get data and you treat that data as like, maybe it happened, maybe it didn't, maybe it was or wasn't real data. And then you change your beliefs in this kind of weighted way with it's like 50% likely that data obtained. And so that's uncertainty over the data was sort of the way we put mistrust of others into the model. Cool, Steve is up next. Yeah, thanks, Kaylee. <clears throat> Great talk. I, uh, I, I was wondering, have you ever tried to put all of this together into the, the simulation from Hill, you know, the sort of early 20, 21st century model where, where everything is, you know, polar, I mean, mistrust. Yeah, every, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, what happens? I mean, how additive are these things? Do you have any notion of, of that? No, I've never done that. I don't know how additive they would be. I mean, the closest thing I can mention is I, I just read a paper by another group and now their names are slipping my mind um, where they did an agent-based model. I think they called it something like three types of echo chambers or something where they put in confirmation bias and they put in algorithmic filtering and they put in homophily where you're linking to people who have your same beliefs. So they put in a bunch of different stuff and then they found that polarization emerged. Um, so <laughs> it's not shocking, right? Uh, yeah. But I think there, you know, it might be that starting with our models where we have some more control over what each feature does, combining mm. them might generate stuff that's like you have some more control over than what is causing different things, but we've just never done it. Okay. Cool. So I'll award myself a question. Um, one, one thing that we've started looking at, um, Colin Klein and in my group, um, is the Gini coefficient uh, in these networks. Um, so like Gini is, is it this number that ranges between zero and one? It's usually used to study either wealth inequality or income inequality. Um, but you can also use it to study um, inequality of other sorts, like attention inequality or trust inequality. So the idea would be to, to like count up the number of connections that each node has, um, and that would be their, their wealth. And you could have networks where like one node is connected to everybody and none of them is connected to each other, like the sort of star network, um, which we know to be kind of dangerous in lots of ways, uh, or one where like everyone has three connections uh, that's like a perfectly uh, equal um, uh, distribution in, in the trust or attention economy. Um, and I'd be really curious to hear you speculate a little bit about like what Genie would do and then uh, whether you think that this would be worth uh, investigating uh, with, with the modeling approach. Yeah, so I think that, so across the projects I described here, it actually totally depends on which one you're in, how that type of network structure would change things or impact things. So in the first mistrust model, basically in that model, your network structure just doesn't matter very much because you know um, this evolving trust and mistrust of other people, it almost functions like an evolving network. You know, you can be connected to someone, but as your beliefs grow apart, you treat them almost as if you're not connected to them. And what we find is across 
any sort of network structure we look at, you still get polarization and it emerges as mistrust increases and you know, beliefs get worse as mistrust increases. In the, um, the conformity models, the shape of the network matters a lot. It makes a really big difference to what outcomes emerge. Now, we didn't specifically look at something like the Gini coefficient for um, you know, the, your sort of degree in the network, like how many connections you have. But we did find things like that the star network where you have someone who's connected to everyone and everyone else has very few connections or the wheel, um, their kind of you know, conformity hurts them more because you have this person in the middle who everyone's conforming with. And so if that person's wrong, they can really lead a lot of people wrong. And if everyone only cares about conforming with them, then, you know, you can have these like very bad epistemic effects. Whereas something more, even like the cycle where everyone has two buddies in a ring, um, adding conformity does very little in that model because you have these kind of even social pressures on everybody. Uh, so, you know, that's a case where like that might really matter. In the confirmation bias model, we do find network structure matters, but um, what really matters is something like, it, it doesn't matter that much. And it's sort of like the amount of connectivity is the thing that matters more than something like uh, the Gini coefficient that you're talking about. If everyone's really connected to each other, then um, you could have this kind of effect where they're doing badly because they're all listening to misleading strings of data and going to the wrong belief, but then adding confirmation bias makes them do better. Whereas if you have a kind of sparse network, they weren't doing that badly in the first place. So you don't really need confirmation bias to make them better. So yeah, basically it, it depends <laughs> quite a lot from case to case. Cool. Yeah. I just asked because the, the Gini coefficient in the networks that we've actually measured uh, on on Twitter are usually around 0.9, um, so like super, super high. Mm. Uh, so that suggests that if conformity is in play, that that would be maybe one of the things that's actually uh, occurring in, in the real world. Yeah, and I think it would be interesting. I mean, I assume you've compared, like I would think Facebook should have less of that kind of structure than Twitter would because you have to have symmetric relationships. It would be interesting to look at different, um, you know, different actual social networks and say, like, is something like conformity more at play in one that has these follower structures than one that has symmetric friend structures or whatever? Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I don't see any additional questions, so I'm going to uh, turn things over now to Jay. Um, okay, let me get this going. Okay, can everybody see that? Okay, so I'm excited to be here to talk to you, you know, uh, preceded by uh, two of uh, my most admired scientists um, to talk to you about affective contagion and how things spread in social networks and how that's impacted by identity. What I wanna say from the outset of this is that the work I'm presenting is largely almost entirely led by one of my PhD students, Billy Brady. Uh, so I wanna give him credit from the outset. But what we're looking at is something that's come up in the questions and the talks thus far. Um, so if you look at like voting patterns in Congress over the last 60 years, what you can see is greater polarization. Um, you know, the mechanisms of these things aren't always clear. It's likely that it's caused by multiple uh, factors. Um, and, and this kind of like shows you kind of the before and after picture if the gift goes a little bit too fast. But you can see there are radical differences by political elites in how they've been uh, engaging with one another over time. Um, how that impacts regular people has also been studied quite a bit. Um, so people have polarized quite a bit in at least in America and many other countries um, in terms of their ideology. So Democrats in the US have become more liberal, uh, Republicans have become more conservative. Um, but it's not just that people are polarizing in terms of differences in belief. One of the most uh, interesting things and maybe the most concerning element of it really is that you see uh, really sharp uh, growth in affective polarization, uh, such that the emergence of hatred towards other party has become a stronger force uh, than in party love over time. And it seems to have just been growing and hit its peak in the last 40 years. And it shows no sign of slowing down. 
Um, as I said, this isn't just an American phenomena, so I'm Canadian. If you look at uh, polarization among Canadians, you seem to see a very uh, similar pattern of trends over the past few decades. Um, and in fact, it's led uh, you know, to these types of covers. And this is like the major Canadian magazine, Maclean's, where both parties are wondering what's wrong with the other party. Um, this has been looked at in terms of like how social media plays a role. Is there like, are people getting exposed because of polarization to radically different representations of reality? And how is this affecting their epistemic understanding of the world? Um, I have a, someone come in. Hello. Hello. Okay, I'm, on a call. I'm giving a talk, Jack. <laughs> Sorry, my son just showed up. Um, okay, so what I want to talk to you about now is uh, the psychological aspect of this. So it's not just what's being fed to us by elites and um, you know, by media and social media algorithms. Uh, but the fact that we're hyper identified with political parties um, means that our party identities can become so powerful that they motivate us uh, to place a higher value in beliefs that align with our party identities. And those when those are stronger than our accuracy goals um, that it might lead us to uh, buy in or share um, misinformation, like the information that you've been hearing about so far. Now, how this is manifested online is complicated by the growth of the type of rhetoric that we see online and the types of information that we're getting. So this is a really cool paper that I like by Molly Crockett, who analyzed a bunch of people's real like daily diaries about what where they were experiencing moral information in their day to day. And what she found is that more people are experiencing uh, or learning about immoral acts online than in person and more than print, TV, and radio combined, um, as well as also learning about moral acts. But you can also see that the, what they're learning about is largely about immorality. And so now social media is the primary medium by which we learn about morality and immorality, and especially immorality in this case. And what happens when you see something like this is if it's a, something that violates your morality, you're compelled to respond to it. And so you craft a post and you share it. And then what it does is it triggers all the people in your social network and there can be these cascading effects um, where they share it to their networks and those people share it to their networks. And so you get these ca cascades of, of morality, uh, especially outrage because mostly what people are observing is immorality online. And so this can lead to uh, remarkable social change. So uh, one of the best examples of it in recent years is the Me Too movement. So Me Too is a hashtag uh, that was started on social media. And what you can see here is uh, these circle sizes represent the total Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter posts containing the exact phrase, uh, phrase Me Too within the first 12 hours of the development of the hashtag. So you can see uh, a simple leveraging of social media on multiple platforms can lead to a global awareness of uh, sexual harassment and, and mistreatment. Um, and that has led to massive institutional change in, in media, in academia, in Hollywood, and all kinds of major institutions. Um, it also ha turns out that when we think of uh, the online world, people often say, well, that's you know, not, the re not real life. Um, but more and more work is uncovering that there's connections between this, that the rhetoric people use in protests um, can predict actual behavior online. And so this one paper, which I, I like quite a bit, came out a couple of years ago in Nature Human Behavior, used data from uh, the 2015 Baltimore protest and found not only did the degree of moral rhetoric used on social media increase on days with violent protests, but the hourly frequency of these tweets predicted future counts of arrest during protests, suggesting, and then this, the author's conclusion, there's an association between moralized rhetoric or moralization and protest violence. Um, and so, this is something that we've been trying to study in my lab is understand why do people share this? What are the consequences? Uh, and so I'll give you an example of just some of the studies we've run. Uh, and one of the great things about doing these studies online is you can use massive samples. So this was a paper that we published four years ago uh, with a sample of 563,000 uh, messages on Twitter. Um, and we ran multiple studies on multiple topics, including uh, highly contentious topics like gun control, same-sex marriage, and climate change. And this just gives you some of the examples, some of the words that pop up when you like scrape the uh, Twitter and look at what people are talking about in the domain of climate change. Um, and what we tried to do is figure out uh, what, what types of rhetoric matter. And so we looked at moral rhetoric. And so we used previously validated dictionaries. Um, and we looked at emotional rhetoric because there's lots of research suggesting that emotions play an important role. And then finally, almost like a Venn diagram, we looked for a rhetoric that was in both categories, so moral, emotional. And so that allows us to create three distinct uh, dictionaries that we were going to use to look at 
um, based on not only these previously validated dictionaries, but we ran multiple pilot studies to ensure that people had a pretty good accuracy, lay people, of uh, understanding these distinctions. They could correctly differentiate moral words from moral emotional, and they could easily distinguish moral emotional from, from uh, these emotional words that were in these other dictionaries. So this is a sample of some tweets, and you can see the word in bold is a word that would fall into our moral emotional uh, dictionary. And you can see how it's used by real people um, talking about all kinds of these hot button issues. Um, and so we basically scraped tweets from real people and looked for the impact of this language. And uh, admittedly, this is correlational. So when I use impact, I'm saying that there's kind of a dose dependency in terms of the number of uh, these types of words in a message and then uh, the amount of time that has been shared. And so if you look at in every domain, we found a remarkably uh, consistent effect with actually very consistent effect sizes as well, in part, I think, due to the large sample, um, such that for every additional moral emotional word people put in a, a, a tweet, um, it was 20% more likely to get retweeted. And so most tweets, unfortunately, get shared zero times. Anybody who is new to Twitter is deeply familiar with that. Um, but if you use this type of rhetoric, it's, it's more likely to get shared. And if you have a large network, then it could potentially go viral. I'm going to show you some examples of that later. And what you can see is that uh, this impact was largely for moral emotional words. We didn't really find it for moral words when they were you know, stripped of moral emotions. And we didn't really find any consistent pattern for uh, just purely emotional words. There was a trend in some of the studies, but not in all of them. Um, and so the really big driver of, of information sharing in these types of topics seemed to be moral emotional rhetoric. Um, now, since it's only uh, four years since we published that, but there's been lots of other publications and studies on this in our lab and other labs. So this is just a new meta-analysis we have. And it suggests if you look across all of these studies and all these domains with huge samples, um, that there's about a 13% increase in effect size for every moral emotional word uh, from all of these different studies. And these are different platforms. These are with political elites, regular people, uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, on all of these topics as I've listed here. Um, and you can also see the ones where it seems to go in the opposite direction where all, almost all the small samples. So, there, there is something where there's, you know, noise. Um, the smaller sample you have, the less likely you are to find this. Uh, the larger the sample you have, or if you've pre-registered, we pre-registered five versions of the study with large samples, um, and we found it in four samples. So you're not going to get it all the time across all topics, but uh, on average, if it's a bigger sample, you tend to find it, and the effect size is pretty consistent, as you can see. Um, and so why are these? Why is this information getting shared? And uh, that you know, uh, in the last question and answer period, Mark mentioned the attention economy, um, which is how a lot of people think about uh, how to get information to be spread on social media and to increase engagement is when people are scrolling through like uh, their smartphone. So I have my, my iPhone here, it's about six inches tall. So every time I scroll down on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, or I guess TikTok, I don't really use TikTok, um, that's six inches. The average uh, social media user scrolls through 300 feet of news feed a day. So that's 600 swipes down their phone. And so they just don't possibly have time to read and process everything. And so we were interested in what pops out at them at a glance when they're scrolling through their news feed like this. And what we uh, did was we modified some tasks, classic tasks from the attention literature where words are flashed very quickly. Um, and one of them is called the attentional blink. And your goal is to identify target words in green and hit a button when you see them. Um, and what happens in this study in the lab is normally that if you see a word for a few hundred milliseconds after you're going to miss other words in green. So there's going to be a blink in your attention and you're not going to catch them. Um, but you will catch them if they're emotionally potent. So if the word kill is the second word, even if it's close after the first word, you'll see it. It will pop out to you and it will grab your attention. Um, and so there's lots of uh, work on that by uh, Adam Anderson and Liz Phelps. We followed that up by using these moral and emotional words. And then we found what captures attention in the lab. We looked at those same words online in uh, our sample of you know, tens of thousands of tweets of real people, what we found is that the more a word captured uh, your attention in the lab, the more likely it is to be retweeted by a whole separate set of participants online. And the more moral emotional words you had in those messages, the more they were likely uh, to be retweeted. Um, and so this suggests that what's capturing your attention in these carefully controlled environments is partly what accounts for uh, the spread. And moral and emotional words drive that attentional capture in the lab. Um, 
We then wanted to see uh, how this plays out with uh, political groups. And so one of the things we did was we borrowed uh, from prior work by Pablo Barbera and, and colleagues, and they had validated a way of identifying the political ideology of uh, conservatives and liberals in the US, which is highly correlated with whether you're a Democrat or independent. And it turns out that uh, they could use this based on who those people follow and who follows them to infer people's political ideology. And it turns out that that's a remarkably good predictor of your actual party identity if you're in Congress and as well as your voting record. And so you could just ident use this algorithm to identify who different politicians follow and follow and who follows them to infer their party identity and their voting record in Congress um, with remarkable accuracy. And when we did this, we were able to look at uh, when you're using moral emotional words, who's sharing it? And what we found is all the sharing is almost entirely driven by uh, in-group members. So people in your social network. So people who share your ideological belief system and party identity. Um, and so you can see the in-group slope here, the more and more emotional words you use, uh, you're, it's more likely to get shared among in-group members, uh, but less likely or not very likely among out-group members across the topics. And when we plotted this, um, this is what you see is that most of the information sharing when people use moral emotional words is within their uh, you know, ideological or party cluster. There's not a lot of crosstalk when people use that rhetoric. Whereas when people use talk about the exact same topics using purely emotional or purely moral words, you see more cross sharing. People are willing to engage with it and share it. And so this is the type of language that if you're using that language, you're gonna feel you know, that reinforcement of it getting shared, but you're not gonna realize that it's really probably only among your, your uh, fellow group members. And the data, as you can see, really looks pretty similar to the voting patterns in Congress. Uh, um, and so we went to Congress and we looked at their social media feeds. And what you can see is that they have the same benefit of using moral emotional words. So here's an example of uh, members of the Senate. We also look at all the members of Congress. And you can see that almost all of them benefit from using this moral emotional uh, rhetoric, that their messages are more likely to be retweeted. And you can see that it's kind of like some of the people at the ideological ends of the political spectrum in the US. So Cory Booker, who's one of the far left uh, US senators, Jeff Sessions, who's on the far right of uh, the Republican Senate uh, when he was in office, um, are seem to benefit the most. And so the most partisan individuals use this rhetoric to the largest effect. Um, we also looked at presidential candidates in the year leading up to the 2016 election. And what you can see here is Trump benefits far more than say the average person. Um, so they get, about, as I showed you in the meta-analysis, about a 13% benefit for every more emotional word. It's more likely to get shared, 13% more likely. Um, when Trump uses it, it's on average 27% more likely to get shared. And so when, he, when uh, Clinton uses it, moral, or, moral emotional words have almost no impact. And if you also look at the y-axis here, when Trump's using that rhetoric, it's getting shared 5,000 times or 10,000 times. It's the type of thing that gets in the front page of the news or on, t on, the, on nightly news or talk shows. And so his use of that rhetoric uh, went heavily viral in a way that it didn't work for Clinton. She had almost no impact of moral emotional language on uh, retweet rates. Um, and then if you look at the type of words that they use that were most viral, um, a lot of the ones that Trump used were about like victimization. So victims, abandoned, hurt, brutal, abuse. Um, so he was able to not only use more emotional language, but the ones he used that mattered the most were about collective victimization or personal victimization. Um, and again, if you look on the bottom axis, you can see that the difference between him and Clinton in terms of how much these get shared is, is much higher. So his are getting shared 10,000 or 15,000 times retweeted in that year. And hers were only like 4,000 up to 8,000. Um, we went back in the lab and a lot of this is all correlational. So we wanted to manipulate those words and take the exact same message and just change one word because there's so many other elements of a message that might be confounded with the, when people use that word. It might mean they're more uh, compelled to share it or their social network might be different. Um, so we showed people the exact same uh, moral emotion or exact same tweets or messages and we simply changed one word about it so it was either a moral emotional word or uh, just a neutral word and we found that moral emotional words caused had a direct causal impact on message sharing even when everything else in the message was identical but what we further found is that this was largely driven by partisans so it was really only highly identified democrats or republicans who were re reacting to this type of messaging and sharing it in the lab so it's consistent with when we looked at the social networks online is what we're seeing when we can actually measure people's identity strength in the lab. The other interesting thing is that the flip side is also true. So it's not only the case that 
hyper partisans or strong partisans are more willing to share this type of messaging with moral emotions. But when people see messages that have moral emotions, they infer that the person who shared it is a, is a partisan. <laughs> um, so, so they can correctly infer that the people who type to, tend to use this language are, are more extreme in their identity. Um, and then this effect is, I think, one of the things that connects best to the, tr the theme here of intellectual humility, which is that um, moral emotion sharing leads people to see others as less open-minded and they're also less willing to engage with them. So if you share the exact same message, but just has a neutral word in it and not an emotional word, people are more willing to see you as higher in open-mindedness and more willing to engage with you. And, and I'm inferring this, but we didn't have this in this study at the time, that is because they see maybe an opening or an intellectual humility rather than a, than a, a kind of a black and white way of thinking about it. Um, and so it suggests, again, these are, messages are identical at every single other word in the message, except for one moral emotional word we put in there. So I'll just wrap up now and, and we'll turn to questions. Um, that there's a lot going on here. And, and our way of thinking about when people are engaging with others and, and especially online, uh, and especially around hyper-moralized or polarizing issues, um, that there are aspects of the person, the stimulus, and the environment. And so there's as these aspects of the stimulus, this rhetoric, uh, is more likely to capture our attention in a stream of stimuli that we're not fully engaging with and helps us determine what we should engage with and what we should share. And this is determined by person factors. So how identified uh, with a party are you? Um, is mo motivates you to pay attention to this, but also to engage with it and to share it and to signal that you align with it. And then there's also aspects of the design. And so there's a recent paper at PNAS that suggested that if you look online, um, on, on multiple different platforms, you're more likely to see polarization on Facebook and Twitter, but not on like Reddit or Gab. And so it suggests there might be design features, aspects of, um, and I'll go to this next one, aspects of things like uh, the algorithm or your news feed, which decide uh, to promote things that are hyper-engaging. And the things that are engaging, as we've seen, are tend to be things that are also polarizing, things connected to your identity. Um, and as opposed to other platforms that might use different types of uh, algorithms to prioritize information for you. And so all of these things are operating uh, in, in interaction. And, and this is why I think the, the previous talk was so great is that there's multiple factors here that are all contributing and, and on some platforms all interacting uh, to uh, foment conflict, uh, to prioritize certain types of information that you're, in, that you're seeing. So with that, happy to turn to questions. I always love ending with uh, this chimp here. And this is him, you know, cruising through his own Instagram feed. And you can see uh, it's not, he, he doesn't seem to be that different from us. Um, so it's important for us to uh, obviously understand these things and think a little bit more deeply about how we engage with these things and not just engage in a very primitive way. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions that people might have. And I'll let Mark moderate this. Um, if you don't mind uh, yeah. unsharing your screen, we can go back to the gallery view. And if anyone has a question, uh, please type it in the chat. Seeing none initially, I'll just mention. Um, oh, sorry, Kaylin. Kaylin has a question. Sorry. Um, yeah, so I had a question. I mean, thanks, Jay. This is just so interesting. Uh, and actually, your your image of polarization on Twitter, like if I had gotten to my thank you slide, we swiped that image and I always put it up on my <laughs> uh, So I had a question about different types of moral emotional language. So you sort of lumped it into one category in this talk. Um, and I noticed at least in one point, you said something like outrage, moral outrage is contagious, but of course there's also positive moral emotional language. And I'm thinking about like, you know, the tweet about the teenage boy who chased the car and rescued the little girl from being kidnapped or whatever. And everyone's extremely, you know, morally positive about that and they're joy, you know, expressing joy. And like, do you see distinctions between these different sorts of moral emotions or their valence? And yeah, I'm just curious about that. Thanks, Kaylin. Uh, great question. Um, before I answer, I just have to say I'm a huge fan of your work, and I my lab uh, read your book last summer and, and loved it. Um, so basically, what in the original studies we ran, um, and it was on climate change, gun control, and same-sex marriage, 
Um, what we found is that, and I thought it'd be mostly negative information, but it turns out at least in the, in the gay marriage or same-sex marriage topic, it was actually positive moral emotions that were driving it. And part of it, the reason is because the hashtag that was going viral at the time was love wins. It was after the Supreme Court ruling or around that time. And so these can happen for positive emotions. Uh, but what we're finding when we look at the aggregate and the meta-analysis is mostly for negative moral emotions, especially around the outrage issue. Um, so it doesn't have to be, it's, it, it, and uh, you can find cases where it's positive emotions at the right time and context and topic, uh, but it's mostly negative. I also will say that we originally drew from uh, the Moral Foundations Dictionary that Jesse Graham and John Hyde had created. And we tried to look among different types of moral foundation rhetoric and we didn't find much difference there, which was partly why we've just mainly moved forward with lumping them together. Yeah, that's because moral foundations theory is not um, very good. Um, I'll turn it over to Steve. <laughs> you had to put that dig in. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, um, yeah, thanks. Great talk, really uh, fascinating data. One of the things I'm curious about is whether, well, two things that are, that are related. The first one is, differentiating between affective polarization and issue polarization a bit more, because um, I totally agree with you that there's a huge amount of affective polarization, and also that that is probably symmetrical. Um, now, <clears throat> what I'm less sure about, and I actually wanted to get your, your views of, on, on that on a paper, um, is whether issue-based polarization is symmetrical. And if I can just, can I share my screen? Is that all right? Sure. I, I just want to show you, you should see a PDF with a, with a graph now uh, from a paper by Hare and somebody. Um, and they looked at um, parties in Congress and voting behavior and over 200 years or whatever that is, 100 and, yeah, 140 years. Um, and tried to and, and did some fairly sophisticated statistics on voting behavior, some patterns between the parties to see, you know, where are they, how are they evolving over time. What you can see here yeah. is that polarization is entirely on the side of Republicans and not Democrats, statistically. Um, now, this is in the House. The Senate is a little less uh, convincing, uh, but then there are fewer numbers, so maybe the sample size makes it harder to detect. And I found that to be very interesting because, um, you know, there's other evidence suggesting that Democrats in 2020 don't differ that much from Democrats in 1980 on, on their issues, whereas Republicans have, have gone uh, far more, have become far more extreme. So I, I wonder, your data don't pick that up or can't show it, or do you think this is wrong? I mean, what's your, what's your take on this? Yeah, I mean, in the data that we have here, I don't know if there's a way to look at it, but I have also seen that like, if you plot the party positions of the Democratic Party versus like all these other parties in like Canada, European countries, they're pretty like mainstream left. If you part the Republican Party, they're very far right. So the, the positions of the parties- oh, but they are, haven't always been. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's you a, know. Yeah. <laughs> And it's gotten more, especially under the Trump administration um, and, and continuing. I mean, the news this week of the Republican Party is 70% of them, 70% of Republicans believe that the election was stolen. They're anti-vaxxers, as, as you know, um, as you mentioned in your talk. So there are these asymmetries that are happening um, as well as symmetries. It's like a complex space because you know, what, what's also driving affect, I, my, my concern is often usually about affective polarization more than issue polarization, because I do feel like people have a right to disagree um, about actual issues and we should be debating those and those are reasonable. Um, I think affective polarization is more concerning, especially when it outstrips uh, ideological polarization. Um, and so you're seeing this. So there's this great paper by Karujeri uh, that followed up work by Jeff Lees and Mina Chikara, where they now you now can do interventions to reduce conflict among people because people have such a cartoon version of what the other party believes, thanks to media and social media, that once you debunk that, they're actually more willing to engage with them and have less negative beliefs. It turns out they're actually close on lots of issues, including gun control, uh, immigration, things you wouldn't expect, even, even tax policy. Um, so I think like debunking those things and helps create conversation. Of course, I do think that there's like really important and legitimate differences. There's also really important and legitimate reasons to be 
uh, angry, <laughs> um, like you talked about the insurrection, like if that caused affective polarization among people on the left, there's reason to be because they're threatened by democracy and, and uh, threatened by, bought democracy is threatened. And so you have reason to be outraged about that. Um, yeah. So I don't want to dismiss all affective polarization of that. I think some of it's necessary and important and a reasonable response to situations like that. Yeah, of course. I mean, just one comment, if I may. I mean, the, the gorilla or the elephant in the room, of course, is, you know, the algorithms that are contributing to this. And um, I, I think, you know, talking about affective polarization and how to solve it, you, you can't do that on the basis of psychology alone. You also got to got to look at the um politics of algorithms and the fact that there's no public accountability no auditing and no one actually knows what these do <laughs> except when we hear that facebook knows very well that they're contributing to extremism and polarization in the u.s but decide not to do anything about it because it would affect their bottom line yeah uh, i'm writing a paper on that right now on social media and polarization and the mechanisms and the one we know the least about is algorithms except for we know from like journalistic reporting where right. they've you know had an algorithm that was based on like making the world better and a reduced polarization and then they decided to get rid of it because it was reducing engagement so they can't exactly. analyze it yeah. exactly and i think precisely yeah i don't know did you read our jrc report jay weren't you also writing one for the european commission yeah yeah uh, yeah so we just wrote a whole report i'll pop the link in the chat in, in case sense. anybody's interesting interested because that goes right to the heart of this issue uh, and and reviews all that because the algorithms to my mind are are the biggest uh obstacle yeah. to your depolarization and they're going to be an obstacle until there's some really tough uh regulation and, and political action i think i agree completely yeah. Great. I think uh, Marco is next. How about, I, and I thought that was super interesting, um, how about turning this around rather than asking how, how much more often are moral, are tweets with more emotional terms shared, just asking which tweets are more likely to be shared, which words do they contain? Because there's a subgroup of those more emotional terms that really drive that result. Yep. Is there perhaps a group that's cross-cutting you know, to, 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 to words that aren't moral emotional that make tweets more likely to be shared? Yeah, so so I don't have it in the slide deck and I don't have it at the top of my head, but there's some tweets that, some words that are more likely to get shared a lot uh, and others that aren't. I, I also am working on like re-engineering this to, to select based on, I have this paper, it's a, got rejected, we have to resubmit it, but it was by uh, Almog Simchon, so I wanna give him credit, where we looked at polarization, that there's some words that are hyper-polarizing and others that aren't, even if they're moral emotional. Um, I don't wanna, so those things like are related, but you can differentiate them. Uh, and so I, I don't have it off the top of my head, but it's in my paper, if you look, we have a list of some of the words, kind of like the ones I showed you for Trump that went most viral, we have it for the whole uh, sample size. And so if you want to like create an effective uh, blog and you want to like get a lot of attention for it, you can like uh, reverse engineer it using that, that language if you want. Uh, cool. So um, given that we're allowing uh, the audience to share screens, I'm going to do that and share something that's a uh, work in progress, but uh, almost entirely finished. Uh, and this is um, an analysis of the tweets uh, about the Black Lives Matter movement in 2020, uh, specifically looking at emoji uh, and hashtags. Um, because, uh, so Jay, you, you, I think your stuff is looking only at words, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, we adjusted so, for images. If it had image, we statistically adjusted for that because it, adding images, but we didn't look at it specifically. Yeah, so the emoji are, are, are weird because they, they show up as images, but they're coded as words. Um, and uh, let's see if I can do this. Right, so this is the, this is like, if you were in an activist community on Twitter, um, these are the emoji and words you would have seen last year uh, if you were paying attention to the Black Lives Matter protests. So you would have seen like the rainbow of, uh, of raised fists, you would have seen the rainbow of hearts, you would have seen a bunch of stuff about like black pride uh, and also uh, gay pride. 
Um, you would have seen stuff about uh, Breonna Taylor uh, and specifically like feminist approaches, uh, in intersectional approaches um, to uh, protest and um, activism. Um, if you were in the Democrat cluster, you would have seen mostly the same things, but also stuff about like the blue wave and the blue heart, which is associated with like um, the, you know, the electing Joe Biden and, and whatever. Um, but you would have also seen like a bunch of people saying like, hey, look at this, this is really important. Uh, the, this down pointing finger when people retweet stuff. Um, uh, whereas if you were in the like MAGA cluster, you would see a bunch of QAnon uh, conspiracy theories and a bunch of like, we love the cops stuff. Um, and then also a lot of naming of enemies. So like Democrats, Antifa, BLM, yeah. um, and a bunch of anger. Um, and uh, still also the, the down pointing finger, but only like the cartoon yellow one, which is kind of like a sort of whitewashing. Yeah. Um, and, and then there was also K-pop, which got involved for like a week or so. Uh, so, so I, th I think you, these kinds of analyses are, are, are sort of consonant with each other. Um, we, we're working on this paper right now, um, but I, I think that uh, it, it fits a bit with a lot of the stuff that you're talking about, which is that people will pay attention to things that are moral and emotional, and actually the use of emoji might be more relevant than the use of moral emotional words because they they pop out at us so much they've got color they're more captivating uh and and so on um it's not entirely a a, a question but if you've got like two or three minutes to reflect on it that would be great okay one thing um so first of all it's really cool i love to see that um we i have a new paper revised recent matter hopefully can maybe conditionally accepted it's hard to tell um, led by Steve Rafji, and uh, he's at Cambridge University in Sander Van Linden. And he looked at emojis on Facebook and he found that one, and as well as rhetoric and stuff on social media, or sorry, Twitter. And what he found is that the angry emoji face uh, was far more likely to be used when people are using negative, sharing negative news or information about the outgroup, political outgroup. And in fact, the rate of read, I talk, we talked about effect sizes in my talk, like 13% retweet rate for more emotional words. Um, when people are saying negative things about the other side for Democrats, or Republicans, it's getting retweeted or Facebook shared with that, uh, that or the use of that anger emoji at something like 50 to 100% more per, per message or per emoji use. And so the impact of just negative rhetoric about the other side is far more uh, fruitful if you want to spread your message and moral emotions are even. So, um, and so that's the only way we've looked at them, only part of a project where I've looked at emojis, but I would love to talk about it more with you offline. And I think I have maybe one more- Kaylin has a follow up on that. Yeah. Kaylin had maybe one more question as well. Oh, um, yeah, I, I didn't mean to, interrupt the back and forth though. I mean, I find this really interesting because emojis have like ex literal expressive content in them. I had just been going to ask about like, you know, underlying causes, you know, why, uh, so I had seen earlier stuff about emotional tweets being highly viral, but it seems like you're arguing it's really this particular kind of emotional content. And do you have a story about why? Um, so, I mean, there's a, a longer story, which is about the function of moral emotions that they, uh, one of the reasons, and we're getting into it now, is we think they are really clear signals of identity that you can use online. Um, and so it really distinguishes who you are. It's obviously predicted by who you are, and people can clearly tell uh, that. So I think that's one thing. Um, it's, it's on when I'm talking about moral emotions and moral contagion, it's always unclear to me whether people are actually feeling this. I mean, many times they are feeling outrage, but a lot of times it's like you're in the elevator, you check this out, you share it with like an ang, you know, click the angry button or add an angry word. Um, and so I think, and Billy's finding this now new work that I'm a part of with Molly Crockett, where people's ex perceptions, pe people's perceptions of when you use that uh, messaging about how angry you are 
actually outstrips how angry you actually are if you rate it. And so some of it seems performative or maybe just misunderstood about what it means. So that's why there is a little bit of, cause it's a very public facing environment that, that rewards that type of expression. Uh, and so there is a mismatch between what people are saying online and what they're actually feeling. Great, so we can actually add, end a few minutes early. Um, thanks everyone, really appreciate all of the speakers, really appreciate all of the audience. Um, we will eventually be posting the recording of this to, uh, to YouTube. So if you don't mind sharing that to create moral emotions, that would be fantastic. <laughs> um, and we have one more uh, uh, session tomorrow for anyone who has the time and is willing to wake up at 4.30 in the morning like me. Um, uh, thank you all and good night. Thanks, everyone.